Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on November 13th, 2022, are from Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 2a, Our last semi-continuous first reading until next year is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 65, 17 through 25, Psalm 98, our last reading from 2 Thessalonians, which is chapter 3, verses 6 through 13, and Luke 21, 5 through 19 is our gospel text. Well, this is always the second to last Sunday of the church year, we always get something from the apocalyptic discourse or the prediction of the temple's destruction in the synoptic gospel. So we'll have this, we have reign of Christ next Sunday, and then Advent one will also take us back to this kind of, of text. And so you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> the eschatology is coming. Which I think is okay. I, I, I think it's, I've said this in years past, that it's important to talk about how mind-blowing it is to imagine Jesus saying this to his followers as they are walking out of the temple or walking through the temple. And he's like, see all this stuff? And if you've seen any of the reconstructions, right? Just to, it, it's ludicrous to imagine all these stones are going to be thrown down. Then you imagine what this does sound like after the year 70, when Luke's being written somewhere, what, 80 to 95, who knows, somewhere, maybe soon there. What does that sound like when this massive cataclysm has taken place and the testimony of the gospel is Jesus saw this coming and warned us about it and told us that life would be unsafe? And what does it mean today in 2022? What does it mean for us to think about calamities of the past, to think about for me and maybe most of our listeners, a relatively comfortable existence as a Christian without any fears of persecution of any kind. There's nothing that's significant. It's going to keep me awake at night. So what does that then mean? Not just to make me feel guilty that my life isn't harder, but but to talk about the, the way of the cross, to talk about what we should expect from life in a world that's unsafe because the world itself is not uh, a, a system that that all guarantees comfort and ease to all of its inhabitants. And human societies, of course, are mercurial and dangerous places for many people. So how is that good news? But I, 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 think, to, I think we have to make it I hear I hear you. And then, Matt, a couple of weeks ago, we were actually talking, I think, about maybe the Psalms and how um, the earth quaking and trembling had more resonance now. Um, and so uh, as you were doing the biblical history of time, my mind was doing uh, a history of recent times um, to read this text um, post 9-11, to read this text today in the midst of what's happening in the Ukraine. Um, I have friends that are there and prior to the war, there were, you know, there were just some things, comments that were made, absolutely no way. And then to see the uh, ruin because um, those very communities, those very buildings um, um, were destroyed, um, you know, just just in the last few months. And so there's a there's a I think exactly what you're asking for is is what we need. Um, but to help folks realize that this isn't an ancient comparison that we're making. It's just a comparison that might not be in our zip code. Though, of course, people who live close to uh, George Floyd Square, as we do, it's in our zip code. Um, and uh, I, I, I think the weight of what this is describing, when we look at, there's no way we can see this destruction 
And then what do you do in the aftermath? Calls us to say, when we can't believe the moment is going to get that bad, we still have the responsibility of giving this particular testimony. And when things are quite clearly this bad, we still have the responsibility of giving this testimony. And in either situation, we're not going to be loved for it. We're not going to be lauded for it. But it is still our task to give this testimony. I think one of the other features about this text that's important is this this prediction of the of the temple and that the claim of uh, you know not one stone will be left upon another; all will be thrown down, and then and then into that is the naming of of false prophets or false teachings. And I find that to be a curious dynamic here as well, that when when we look at when we look at sort of the structures that we've had in place or whether that's buildings or ecclesial structures or uh, the way in which the pandemic and as you mentioned, Joy, the way in which um, uh, George Floyd's murder has sort of uh, upended these these structures or these foundations on which we have built so much of our faith and our church life and our how our how we live, and when all of those are crumbling around us, who are we going to listen to? Uh, what are we going to listen to? I think that's a call of this text as well. I uh, and that that what what word will we follow whose word will we follow whose voice will we follow i uh, and i think that could be an important maybe call for preachers depending on their context but i uh, but where where and how have have their communities or their context experience this kind of upheaval or this kind of you know the crumbling of the foundations and what what has what kind of voices have drawn them away or or pulled them away and um, that I think that's an important aspect of this text as well. Well, and what is the testimony in the midst of that as well? It 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 can't be we told you so. It can't be this is God's punishment. It's it's what the text never quite says. It never, at least this part of the, the text doesn't doesn't quite say in terms of what the hope is, what the future hope is, where will God be found in the midst of these kinds of cataclysms? That line that you just said really rings for me, Matt. Um, uh, you, we can't say, I told you so. Uh, and the reason it rings for me is this is one where you don't prepare in advance. And prepare in advance, in light of what you just said, could mean, I'm just going to say what I've always said, except for when you've lost something you've never thought you were going to lose, um, when the thing that you've put your confidence in is gone, um, when those that you thought were speaking truth are proved to be false prophets, um, I need a, a fresh hearing of the character of God and the promise of God made known in Jesus so that it is good news today, not it was good for them back then, or it might be good for someone else pie in the sky by and by. Um, no, I need, I need that truth today. And I need to be able to speak it with the confidence that says, I might be speaking against those false prophets that we've come to believe, which means I'm not going to be lauded but it's the only hope that we have when everything has been torn down. I think also it's, uh, you know, what, what do we do in this, uh, in this kind of reality of things being torn down and, uh, and whose voice do we listen to and what is the response to all of this? Uh, I think I'm going to take a cue from Luke here and and say, well, 
what do you see? What do you choose to see? Where, what is your focus? This is going, you know, going all the way back to the beginning of Luke of, of repent and that, that turning around and re reorienting your sight. And I, I think I'm going there because the verses, the story right before the grandeur of the temple is the, and Jesus, you know, Jesus looks up and sees the rich people putting in their gifts to the treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And I, uh, and, uh, and it, it, that, that contrast between, you know, what Jesus sees and what we see, uh, I think could also be a direction that, um, that, uh, you know, that, that could be unpacked um in some way shape or form but uh yeah so it's 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 a call to yeah what what do you see and to what will you give witness that you have seen uh and what draw what to what are your eyes drawn <laughs> uh when it comes to uh, the kinds of constructs that we have put around theology and religion and faith. And so, so maybe some honesty about that too. Yeah. And it's an up until the moment word, because if, if I follow your lead and look back at what we hear, uh, all of these other teachings are occurring in the temple. So there's no abandonment because there's the possibility or the promise of destruction. It's, it's we keep right on going up until it happens. And then we keep right on going after it's happened as well. Okay, Malachi. <laughs> I, I, ah. I know Malachi is not, not a favorite. I love Malachi, except for I don't like the verses of Malachi. I like the whole of Malachi. It's um, it's it's a book that, in in its entirety, um, makes clear what all of these little pieces that the 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 um, the lectionary would pull out or that we are familiar with. Um, actually have uh, even a greater punch uh, than this little one line out of context, you know. So um, uh, I, for this verse, I like to remind us that uh, the return of, of, of uh, Christ is, is going to be more like a pink slip uh, at work on a Friday afternoon than uh, a, uh, a fire burning in the hearth. Um, and that we've got to be um, aware of the difficulty of the moment of expectation in order to appreciate um, the promise of the moment, which is so often what we do with this verse. You know, it's like um, this expectation that the sun of righteousness uh, shall rise with healing in its wing is such a wonderful promise, but it comes in the midst of all of the wrongdoing of Malachi. Malachi speaks of the priests not being faithful, the very leaders of the people of God not being faithful. So this word of hope and promise comes in the midst of their brokenness and failure. So it, it's, it's more like a pink slip than a hearth. I think what I would do is maybe just show videos of calves sleeping and, um, <laughs> and then people can draw their own conclusions. <laughs> it's safer than talking about the uh, dysfunction of the uh, religious leadership. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Malachi is, you know, really angry with, with the priests. Like you talked about joy. I also would, one, the the pairing is frustrating for me to put this with Luke because what Malachi says in in four one, you know, burning like an oven and you know <laughs> burning up all the arrogant and the evildoers, I would simply point out that that language is absent from Luke 
uh, Luke 21. So before people do, which I think a lot of us have been implicitly trained to do, to collapse all of these different eschatological visions into one or to see the return of Christ as, uh, as more formed by sinners in the hand of an angry God, by Jonathan Edwards than anything else, uh, that that's not necessarily the vision of what's taking place in Luke 21. So just to be careful, the uh, again, I think I mentioned this last week, there are so many eschatological visions in the Bible and they don't all square neatly and tidily with each other. And so which ones we lean on says a lot about us in a given moment. And yeah, and I th- I think in, yeah, the pairing, I agree, the pairing is unfortunate. And in that regard, I would just take on Malachi on its own. And just, and I think the commentary is really helpful. I was going to say, what would you say about that? Well, just introducing people to, you know, a, a, a kind of vision, right, that, that here it is in scripture and what do we want to do with it? And, and, and that it concludes our, our, you know, the Christian, the Christian old Testament too. And so what difference does that make? How does that, how does that shape how we interpret it? And, um, and so I don't know, probably more of like a Bible study or an adult forum than a sermon, but it's all I got. (laughs) Isaiah, so we're done with the semi-continuous reading. And this is we've a been, great way to end it, I think. It is. I it is a great way because uh the uh you have these beautiful words of um from Isaiah and and some you know some fam- familiar words, I think, for people. Uh and uh a and unique eschatological vision though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just appreciating um, Matt's word to us these last couple of weeks. This is in itself as familiar as it is a unique eschatological vision. And to point out too that this comes near the end of the the prophetic era. That this right, this is more toward the end than the beginning in terms of, of the prophets that we know about, or at least the prophets who wrote, whose writings have survived to us, which makes it an interesting sort of, is coda the right word, a kind of conclusion to the work of the prophets and the fire that, that the prophets speak with and the prophetic personality or prophetic character that comes forth in the way of calling people back and insisting on God's faithfulness. And now you've got a vision that's, that's looking forward. I, I don't want to say that this part of Isaiah is presents itself as a conclusion to all the prophetic literature, but, you know, canonically speaking, there's something here about helping us think, well, where did all that get us? <laughs> like where, All the rise and fall of the Kings and the nations and, and exile. And now this, really difficult task of trying to get returnees from the exile to play nice with the people who stayed, what that means for not just remaking a nation, but really remaking a religious institution and cult and all of those things. And circling all the way, oops, sorry. No, go ahead, please. And circling all the way back to, I don't know, four weeks ago, um, what it means to belong, because that has to be reinstated here. But I think, yeah, and I think, too, that if you've been working through the semi-continuous readings and and then especially these last weeks of of the prophets, uh, that sort of what does it what what is gained by looking back through that that narration through the lens of Isaiah uh, and the promises of Isaiah and the confidence of Isaiah claims about God um, that could be. That could be, a, I, that could be a, 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 I think, maybe a, an important testimony of God's faithfulness and, and why the prophets prophesied to begin with. You know, they weren't too excited about the job to begin with. Uh, and so, but yet at the end, uh, at the end, there are these words of hope. And, uh, and so, I don't know, that could be another direction given this being the last reading in the semi-continuous readings. And, and 
if there's been attention to the sociocultural historical context that these words are giving in. And with Isaiah, if you see this as a, a, a trilogy or, you know, a, a two volume, I, I, I ascribe to the three volume, but the timing for these words are always opposite what the message of the words are. So um, th this is not the best time in ancient Israel's history to be hearing this word of hope, which is why the confidence of the prophet is so important and why the words of hope are so life-giving uh, because this is not when you want to hear this word, you know, or, or this is not, this is, this is exactly when you need to hear this word because it's the hardest time to believe that God will show up again. It's interesting that it falls on the same date as the Luke 21 text as well. It, I don't believe they're intentionally necessarily paired up like that, but in the midst of all the calamity that Jesus describes, this Isianic vision of, of Jerusalem and of longevity and of well-being is still mm -hmm. always in the air. Mm -hmm. so know what I would do with Psalm 98? You know what I would do with this? You know what I would do with this? Uh -oh. Use it liturgically? Uh -oh. I'd use it as the call to worship. Yeah. Even yeah, more yeah. specific for those of us who have calls mm -hmm. to worship in our yeah. services. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's I'm great. never the one who says that. I wanted to get that in. I have nothing else to say about it. <laughs> No, it's I, it's 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 a psalm that is. It's one of those psalms that's like truly what a psalm is. I mean, we know what psalms are, but a psalm is a song and meant to be sung. And so, it it, it seems like one of those psalms that if you don't if you don't sort of embody it in that way, there's something sort of wrong. <laughs> uh, that it doesn't. It's not about explaining. Uh, or offering information, it is. It's a response to to God's promises and God's glory and God's grace. And so, absolutely, I would use it. I think a call to worship is great. Yeah. On it, but just somewhere in the service where you're giving people an opportunity to to call forth that promise or to respond to that promise, I think is key. I love it as a call to worship as well, in the sense that. The way that any of the texts that are for this day to to first be reminded of the faithful character of God and how God has shown up and shown out before going into any one of those texts will only heighten what the sermon on those either of those texts is actually saying. It also, you know, just to keep beating my eschatology drum here, the the final line about God judging the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. This again could be woven into a bigger conversation around the future if, if that's where a preacher was going. And to remind people that the judgment, God's commitment to judgment is an expression of God's love, is a facet of divine love or a facet of divine righteousness. If we understand righteousness less consuming fire and more commitment to human well being which sometimes is a bit of a fire, a refining fire, but is also a, 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 a deep expression of God's commitment to fixing the things that inhibit human flourishing mm -hmm. in, in all those ways. And mm -hmm. because judge, you know, the word judgment is so charged, not just in churches, but elsewhere and yeah. to continue that work. Yeah. With that Second Thessalonians. I think what? that I think what Matt is saying allows us to move into Second Thessalonians. So I'm glad we're there, um, because uh, one way of recognizing this is to think specifically of the kind of work um, that was being done in the first century, um, which was crossing all. You've heard me say this before. It was crossing all of the caste and class systems of Roman and Greek culture where it was caring for one another, where it was providing for one another, where it was fellowshipping across those lines. And so here in, in Second Thessalonians, this recognition that says um, we weren't idle and that we weren't just getting, um, but that, uh, or, or using someone else's resources because we're who we are and they ought to give us something, but that we, we were industrious and that we, 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 we worked for, uh, our resources. Uh, we got 
proper pay for our labor um, becomes a, a, a judgment for the kind of people who would say, you know, well, you know my title, you know my status, so just give it to me. And then it becomes a, uh, a word of hope that says, uh, if we look at verse 13, do not be weary in doing what is right. And what is right always has been extending hospitality, equity, and justice to the people of God. And that is the world that Jesus died for, not just the folks that are in our particular clan. That's really countercultural then. I think it's pretty countercultural today. Yeah, absolutely. It is and needs to be rethought in terms of the dividing lines that still exist. The the commentary is really helpful here talking about idleness as disorderliness and that the, the, the problem here that appears to be taking place in the community addressed isn't just that some people are being jerks, but that what, whatever it is they're doing, that's either maybe they stopped working because they think that Jesus is coming back tomorrow or it's causing problems within the community. It's causing dissension or some kind of conflict in the community, which is also ruining the community's witness. And I don't necessarily mean witness in the sense of, hey, we're all happy family here, but in terms of being a community of eschatological expectation that's actually deeply engaged with the world around them now, as opposed to being a separatist withdrawal kind of a community. And that is such an important message on its own, uh, particularly when we think of the kinds of eschatological, and we've been using that term a lot. Uh, and I, I want to kind of pull back a little bit. It's one of the things that I say in my preaching, our, our preaching class, right, Joy, is that you can't use these big words and not, <laughs> and, uh, or you use these words when you're sitting on an airplane, you don't want anybody to talk to you. I mean, you, uh, you can't use these words in a sermon and not pull back and say, this is a major theological category like Christology, soteriology, <laughs> you know, uh, these are hugely important ways of understanding who God is and what God does and what God's about. And so I think that's the thing about eschatology too, that doesn't, that I, I don't know that people hear about as much because eschatology gets in the majority of conversations construed as the end times and the end of the world and and the way in which you said Matt that then the call is to that separatist kind of living or just or this is the huge problem with climate change and ecology that uh we don't have to do any of this because you know the world is going to come to an end so it really this text really is a call to what does life look like in a realized eschatology uh, what does life, what, what, what kinds of behaviors are called for? Uh, what kind of community will we be that, that embodies the promise of, of a future with God here and now? And that's, I think that is a, that's an important aspect of eschatology to which this text speaks. <laughs>